Hi, I'm Mark Hughes. Welcome to this edition of Disability Viewpoints, now in our 25th year, and I'm proud to say that. Also, my very special co-host today is Mr. Nick Wilkie from the Metropolitan Center for Independent Living, and he is a very special guest we'll talk to in a minute. Kristen Burgess is going to be on with me for uh, talking about the Americans with Disabilities Act and celebrating its 33rd year. We've come a long way. We've got some ways to go yet. So we'll cover all that information in just a minute. Nick, who are you going to talk to today? With me today is my colleague and friend, Fran Tobin. She works as a COVID community coordinator for the Metropolitan Center for Independent Living. So she's not only my colleague, but she's also my friend. As, as we know, we've been, we've been dealing with um, the pandemic for a while, and we'll, mm -hmm. we're going to continue to deal with it. Absolutely. And this is one of the ways that, um, that MCIL is consistently Absolutely. helping that's, out in this area. That's all coming up next on Disability Viewpoints. We're going to have everybody stay tuned to SPNN because we're coming up next. Welcome back to Disability Viewpoints. I'm Mark Hughes. With me is Kristen Burgess, who has accomplished a lot of great things in her life. Kristen, welcome to the show. Great to have you. Yeah, thanks, Mark, for, for having me today. Um, I, like you said, have a lot of stuff that I carry around with me behind my name, so lots of credentials. Um, some of them in regards to degrees that I have, but also uh, I am a certified ADA coordinator and a member of a national group of trainers um, known as the Training Leadership Network that happens through the 10 different uh, ADA centers across the country that are regionally located. I am currently pursuing a doctorate in education. Um, it's actually specifically educational leadership up at uh, Minnesota State University Moorhead and hope to be done with that here in the spring of 2025. So. Well, congratulations. Good for you, and I would bet you will be. The American Disabilities Act is about 33 years old, and even though we've done a lot of great work, uh, we still have a lot more to do, and we're moving the mountains one pe pebble at a time. You know, at 33 years, as of July 26th this year, and so we, we've done some pretty big things mm -hmm. in those 33 years, like curb cuts um, and door openers and just lots of lots of physical access. But some of the other things maybe haven't happened as quickly as we would like. Um, and some of those things tend to be around eliminating lots of those attitudinal barriers that those of us with disabilities experience. Um, so things like discrimination in housing and employment, and we've been seeing some movement. And, and I think this year in Minnesota in particular, the legislature made some really big um, pieces of movement. Mm -hmm. um, we, we passed some new legislation. And so that's, that's a step in the right direction as we continue to move forward with realizing what the ADA is really about, and that's about civil rights for people with disabilities and making sure that we have the access that we're entitled to have. And there were four laws actually passed this past legislative se uh, session. There were like four big laws that passed the session. You mentioned a couple of them. So we've got adult changing facilities coming up that those need to be installed in, in new renovations and new builds um, for large venues. Um, another one that you mentioned is that training of supervisors. So supervisors and hiring managers, um, that actually was an existing piece of legislation that was amended. And that now requires folks to have additional training on things like bias against people with disabilities. So things like accommodations and helping supervisors realize what their role is in that process, but also that accommodations are usually pretty simple things and they're not as complicated as we sometimes think they might be. Mm -hmm. And so it's with that training, we help to eliminate that bias, help supervisors realize that you know what? People with disabilities make really great employees, 
And there's usually not too much that we have to do to make sure that those folks have that access and ability to do the work um, just like anybody else you're, with you're, maybe a few minor edits. But uh, again, back to employment, if I were discriminated against under the ADA law, who uh, can I talk to about that? What would you recommend? There are a whole bunch of different agencies and, and places where you can go to get support if you feel like you are being discriminated against uh, in relation to the ADA specifically. So um, I mentioned those 10 regional ADA centers. You could connect with any one of those. They've got a technical assistance line that you can call toll free. Um, they've got web resources if that's an easier uh, way to access them, but you can connect with any of those regional centers and they can help answer questions and then connect you with other places if you feel that that's discriminatory practice that's um, happening to you. Uh, within Minnesota itself, there's also the um, Department for Human Rights. Uh, you can take complaints to them. At the federal level, um, many agencies have an Office of Civil Rights built into them. Um, I work most often with the office that's embedded within the Department of Education. But again, um, OCR or Office of Civil Rights exists in many agencies. And then there's also a Department of Justice who also has some jurisdiction with um, ADA. So there are lots of different places that you can go. Um, there's also, you know, more traditional legal avenues. There's a disability law center. That would be another option for the particular areas of law that they handle. They don't right. encompass everything, but they certainly do some aspects of that. So lots of resources. Um, you can also reach out to the Disability Hub yeah. within Minnesota, and they've got lots of resources to connect you to as well as our uh, Minnesota ADA branch. If if my company wanted more information or uh, disability etiquette, would I, would I go through those uh, that you just mentioned too? So again, those regional centers can connect you with anybody from the TLN program. Um, so trainers such as myself, they can they call us they say hey we've got this group or this person or this agency that's looking for some training or would just like to have a consultation about disability etiquette or figuring out what their needs really are and um, they'll connect that group or that individual with one of the TLN folks and then we'll have that conversation figure out what the needs are what we can do to help support Sometimes it's training, sometimes it's just that consultation conversation right. um, where we're just providing a, a little bit of information. But um, those trainings are great because we can customize them to any agency um, and what their needs are. So it could be as simple as disability etiquette. Um, it could be as complex as getting supervisors to better understand the interactive process for getting employees, uh, their accommodation needs met. So if I wanted to get involved in, in disability advocacy issues, right? How would I get involved in that with the advent of COVID? There's more and more people out there. And then secondly, how can we get a hold of you at your office? And then thirdly, is there a final thought that you may have had that on this interview that we, we, we might have missed? I think there, there are, again, lots of opportunities. There's, um, there's a fantastic network of self-advocacy groups across the state. Mm -hmm. um, there's actually a website that lists a whole bunch of those groups and how to connect with them. Right. Um, some of them meet on a regular basis. Others are a little less frequently, but right. um, definitely options to get involved with different groups, no matter where you are in the state. There is also a self-advocacy conference coming up this fall. I believe it's coming up in September. And so that's another great way to get involved. There are some other learning opportunities if you're not exactly feeling comfortable as a self-advocate just yet, um, or just an advocate in general, maybe not just for yourself. Maybe you're a family member and you wanna advocate for your family or your friends. Um, there are other mechanisms. So the Minnesota Governor's Council on Developmental right. Disabilities has pioneered and cultivated this great program called uh, Partners in Policymaking. 
And so that's one way to get more education around what it is to be a strong advocate. Um, if you're not so much of a classroom kind of person, if you're more of an artistic sort of learner, um, another entity, Upstream Arts, mm -hmm. is also doing self-advocacy classes that um, are more arts focused so that uh, those that tend to learn better in that more creative kind of thought process, that's a mechanism that you can um, utilize to get that training that way. Um, so lots of opportunities. Um, there are other opportunities such as just doing um, visits with your legislator and just letting them know what's going on with you. Right, and right? Then, Sharing and that story is really helpful. If you have questions around ADA, reach out to any of those resources mm -hmm. uh, and I guess uh, enjoy the 33rd anniversary celebration right. um, and continue to fight for your civil rights. Right. Yeah, thanks for being on, Kristen. Kristen Burgess gave us a lot of information in a short time about the 33rd anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And uh, stay tuned. We'll be back with more Disability Viewpoints in just a moment. Is reading hard for you? Do you struggle to see the print? Does your brain have a hard time processing text? Do you get tired just holding a book? Does your disability make reading a chore? At the Communication Center of State Services for the Blind, we believe there's a reading solution for everybody. The problem isn't your disability. The solution is finding a format that works for you. At the Communication Center, we put books, magazines, newspapers, and other materials into audio, braille, and e-text. We have a 24-7 reading service you can access from your phone, computer, or smart speaker where we read local papers, current magazines, and the latest books from sci-fi to romance to history to self-help. What's more, we're connected to the National Library Service for the Blind and Print Disabled, which has hundreds of thousands of books available in accessible formats like audio. Don't let the name State Services for the Blind fool you. All of these services are available to any Minnesotan with a disability that makes reading print difficult, and they are free. There are no hidden costs or fees. You do not need to have a vision loss to qualify. If you struggle to read because of a disability, call us and talk to us. We're Minnesota's accessible reading source, and we're here for you. Information is power, and everyone should have access to information in a way that works for them. So call us at 1-800-722-0550. Welcome back to Disability Viewpoints. I'm your co-host this month, Nicholas Wilkie. With me today is my colleague and friend, Fran Tobin. Uh, as our viewers know, um, I work for the Center for Independent Living. I am happy to report that Fran is my colleague at the Metropolitan Center for Independent Living. Um, and I'm so excited to have her on today to talk about um, the role that she's been doing for the last three and a half now, yes. I believe. So with that, Fran, welcome. Thanks for coming on the show. Um, I'm very excited to have you on to talk about our content. And I'm just going to jump right into it. Well, I'm, it's a pleasure being here. Thanks for having me, Nick. No problem. No problem. So for starters, can you tell our viewers a little bit about, a little bit about your role? At sure. The, I'd be at happy the Center to. For Independent Living? So I'm a COVID community coordinator. And uh, the COVID community coordinators are staff from communities, uh, community organizations rather, uh, that connect Minnesota's diverse communities to COVID-19 testing, uh, vaccination, personal protective equipment, and other resources as well as provide access and support for uh, comprehensive health recovery post-pandemic. So um, the CCC teams contract with the state uh, to serve communities hit hardest by uh, COVID-19. 
uh, which include communities of color, American Indian communities, um, the LGBTQ plus communities, and Minnesotans with disabilities. Awesome. Awesome. And so, Fran, did, did this work as, as a COVID community coordinator, did it start like immediately when pandemic started? Well, the uh, COVID community coordinator program through the state, I believe, uh, started in November okay. of 2020. Okay. And um, MCIL came on board with a COVID community coordinator team uh, for the disability community at that time. Awesome. To put it mildly, it, it did completely upend many people's lives. Yeah. Um, not to mention their livelihoods. Mm -hmm. um, as we had talked a little bit about, um, even before the pandemic, we were talking about PCA shortages and yeah. the pandemic exacerbated that. Right. Um, there were work, sh work stoppages um, due to you know, the shelter in place emergency uh, measures um, that caused a lot of community-based services like supported employment and day programs. Um, it caused them to close for that time period um, while you know, public health officials uh, tried to figure out how best to um, stem the tide of infection. Mm -hmm. So um, you might recall that prior to the vaccine, um, congregate living settings uh, like nursing homes and um, group homes, for instance, prohibited visitors right. uh, inside their facilities. And this was a difficult decision made in the interest of safety, uh, but nonetheless, it caused profound social isolation and right. depression for right. a lot of individuals. And um, this rift in daily life um, was felt by people who were immunocompromised and still is. Right. Um, and people living in congregate settings and attending, you know, day training and habilitation programs, just to name a few. Yep. Um, the, their whole world kind of shrank to the yep. size of their living quarters. And um, people lost, you know, their daily connection to community right. and friends and job coaches and PCAs and even being able to see their own family in some cases. Right. And so I think that, um, it's important to hold space for that and remi right. remind people that um, people are still recovering from, from that trauma. Um, you know, it, it took some time to strategize how people could gather safely and um, how to bring these services back through mitigation efforts, um, like improving indoor air quality mm -hmm. and filtering that air, um, moving activities outdoors, um, whenever possible. Obviously in right. Minnesota, there are right. quite a few months worth. That's yeah. not ideal. Right. Um, so um, I do want to also point out that it was uh, so impactful, transformative even, um, when the availability of vaccinations oh, yeah. and boosters for COVID-19, especially the most recent, the bivalent booster, um, which pr offers the most broad protection against severe illness and death, mm -hmm. Um, for COVID-19, and this is the best way that everyone um, of all communities um, can protect themselves from severe right. illness and death due to COVID-19. Yep, and COVID is also not going anywhere. Fran, yeah. Fran what, was that, what was that fact? It's well, um, recently uh, I heard a figure reported that um, one person worldwide uh, passes away from COVID every four minutes. So that kind of puts it in perspective Big because time. this was global. This this yeah. in, this impacted uh, everybody everywhere. Big and it still does. Yep. Um, vaccinations uh, against COVID-19 are the best ways that we can um, protect ourselves, mm -hmm. especially with the new booster. Right. Um, and our COVID community coordinator team, speaking of um, some of the ways that we can assist people in the disability community, um, one of those options is available through the Department of Health um, for in-home vaccinations in the state of Minnesota. Um, so our team can help individuals submit requests to the Department of Health 
um, for an in-home COVID vaccination. And um, that is, so that the, is uh, it doesn't have to just be in the metro area, it can be anywhere okay. in Minnesota. You can contact our team and we can assist you with that. Um, we can also provide um, COVID, uh, at-home COVID test kits. Okay. Uh, and we also have PPE care packages, which would be personal protective equipment. Okay. Um, those care packages contain KN95 masks. I believe there's a, a 10 pack of those. Um, we also provide either a box of medium or large gloves, um, some hand sanitizers, and uh, an at-home COVID test, if I didn't say that already. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and then we provide a little um, resource packet awesome. of uh, different things that the COVID community coordinator team can assist people with. What does the public need to know about the end of, end of the executive order? In a broad sense, um, the end of the public health, health emergency doesn't immediately impact like the federal purchase uh, or supply of free COVID vaccines or therapeutics for that. Um, it simply might um, reshuffle the expense for those um, to be reimbursed through insurance. Okay. Um, but there will still be um, funding to provide those free to those who maybe don't have adequate insurance or, or are uninsured. Um, and so that is um, something that will continue. Um, they'll continue to purchase and distribute uh, free vaccines and oral antiviral therapeutic treatments um, to the state and health systems. Uh, and that will uh, continue through late summer, early autumn. So Great. Um, another thing that uh, we want to bring to people's attention is that during the public health emergency, um, many of the uh, services that you have to renew annually uh, like medical assistance, Minnesota care, um, those typically are renewed annually. Mm -hmm. And during the pandemic, um, part of the public health emergency just allowed those things to continue without having right. to renew them. Okay. Now that the uh, public health emergency has ended, uh, people will have to begin renewing uh, those uh, services uh, again in 2023. So I would just say that um, Many Minnesotans uh, will have to complete those renewals for um, Medicaid, Medical Assistance, Minnesota Care. And an excellent resource that can help individuals with that is Breva Health. Okay. Um, you can look them up at brevahealth.com. Um, they also have a number, which is 612-844-0710. And they have um, certified MNsure navigators cool. on staff that can offer free application and renewal assistance over the phone and in person to all Minnesotans across the state. So that's an excellent resource that I wanted to highlight, especially since uh, those renewals will begin again now that the public health emergency Super has cool. ended. What is the best way for people to connect with you and your colleagues? Absolutely. So uh, our, our COVID community coordinator team uh, does have a hotline number. Okay. And uh, that is available Monday through Friday, 8 to 4 30. Um, it does also have a voicemail. So awesome. you can leave us a message and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Okay. Um, that number is 1 800 409 5594. But we also have an email address. Sweet. You know, if, if you know, you'd prefer email contact. Awesome. And that address is M. D H at M C I L dash M N dot O R G. Awesome. Fran, you've been spectacular. I want to thank you for coming on. Um, just a wealth of information that's so important for the disability community and the broader community in the state of Minnesota. Um, we also have, we're hosting an August 23rd um, in person session at the Metropolitan Center for Independent Living. Um, this is, um, we're partnering with the Met Council. Uh, basically, it's a community gathering um, to discuss housing and land use. Sweet. So um, this is available uh, for individuals to register for, where you can share your unique perspective um, and make a difference in the community and kind of share your vision for the future. 
Um, and this is for um, individuals with disability in the metro area. And I will say that particip participants can be paid for their time oh, wow. and um, there will also be refreshments and you can register for that event um, which will be from 9 30 to 11 a.m on the 23rd of august okay you can pre-register for that um, by contacting our ccc team so either our hotline number that i mentioned or that email address Super and we can cool. get you registered for that. Well, awesome. So that's great. We can help you with in-home vaccinations. That's for anybody who has faced a barrier to getting a vaccination out in the community. And that's also extended to caregivers of people who can't um, get out in the community for that vaccine as well. Um, so those are just a few things I, I could go on, but right. um, please uh, check out the CCC team either on MSIL's website, or you can also look up other um, communities of focus that have CCC teams as well on the MDH website. Super cool. Well, Fran, thank you so much for coming. Always a pleasure, Nick. Thanks for having me. I'd like to thank our crew here at SPNN. I'd like to thank my colleague and friend, Mark Hughes, Fran Tobin, um, always, always wonderful to be on the show. And um, we'll be back in just a few, more, a few moments with more Disability Viewpoints. See you soon. Welcome back to Disability Viewpoints. Well, we hope you enjoyed our show. 33 years ago, the Americans with Disabilities Act was uh, signed into law by then President Bush. It is a very important factor if you're disabled that it affects us each and every day of our lives. So we're glad to bring you that information. Kristen Birch just did a great job and she's uh, really moving forward in that subject. And so we hope you'll stay tuned to this program. And Nick, we've enjoyed having you today. Thank you very much for the good works you do at the Metropolitan Center for Independent Living. And Fran, it was an honor having you today. So. Uh, give us your final thoughts. You know, Mark, it's always a pleasure to be a co-host on the show, and I'm consistently thankful for colleagues like Fran that um, continue to do great work in the community, um, offering information and resources to, to our community, not only for people with disabilities, but also providing an awareness for the community that is mm. so needed right now. Well, we don't That's realize, right. even though we're on the latter stages of COVID, how important it is to have these protective information that the Metropolitan Center for Independent Living has and the things that it does. So thank you very much, and we thank you at home for watching Disability Viewpoints. For Mark Hughes, who has been grateful to be part of this show for 25 years, just about. Thanks for watching, and all the team at SPNN, thanks for having us. We'll see you soon. Bye for now.